All right, so jumping now into chapter 13, we are talking about the neoclassical perspective or neoclassical approach, right? And what we know about the neoclassical approach is that in the long run, the business cycle will fluctuate around potential, which we also know is just our full employment, GDP. And so the main building blocks of the neoclassical economics is the fact that one, potential GDP determines the economy's size. And then two, the fact that wages and prices will adjust in a flexible manner so that the economy will adjust back to YP potential GDP. So again, the, the classical economists are focused on the long run, right? Over the long run, the potential GDP determines the economy's size. And when we're talking about potential GDP, right? We're talking about the level of output that can be achieved when all of the resources are fully employed. The whispering is driving me crazy. Thank you so much. So this is all resources, meaning all of the land all of the labor, all of the capital, and all of the entrepreneurial activity. So we know that the unemployment rate in labor markets is never going to be zero. It's going to be three to five percent, right? But again, that three to five percent has to do with frictional and structural unemployment. So this potential GDP, this level of output, corresponds to zero cyclical unemployment. No unemployment due to fluctuations in the real business cycle or business activity. So economists use this actual, uh, use this potential GDP as a benchmark. We, we compare the actual, the real GDP against the potential GDP to determine how well the economy is performing. So the potential GDP is estimated by nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office. And for the United States, at least, most economic recessions and upswings are times when the real GDP is one to three percent above or below. Sorry, I did that wrong. Below or above, right? Because I said recessions first, then upswing, so below, then above, of my potential GDP in a given 
year. So what does all this mean, right? What does all this mean? This means that when we're talking about neoclassical perspectives or neoclassical approaches to things, we're going to be again looking at price level on the y-axis, real GDP on the x-axis, And we're going to have a straight up and down long run aggregate supply curve. So this is determining my potential GDP. Now, over time, we do find that this long run average supply curve, you know, this might be the one for 2020, right? And then over time, this shifts to the right as we, you know, there's more laborers, there's better human capital, there's more capital that's produced, right? So this would be the long run average supply, aggregate supply curve of 2025. So over time, this thing shifts to the right and this would end up being our YP of 2020. And then this would be corresponding to our YP of 2025. So productivity increases, capital accumulation increases, human capital accumulation increases, and as a result, this shifts to the right, potential GDP expands. Now, part of what we talked about is this second assumption here, right? Wages and prices will adjust in a flexible manner. So unlike the Keynesians, neoclassicists say that even if they're sticky in the short run, they're still flexible over time. You know, they say that, yes, an economy can produce above its level of potential GDP in the short run, but it can't sustain that level. So let's talk about this in a graph, right? We know economics is the diagrammatic representation of reality. got price level on the y-axis, we've got output real GDP on the x-axis, we've got a long run aggregate supply at $500 million, and we've got an initial aggregate demand curve crossing that at a price level of 120. 